Turn your radio off. Go watch TV or something. Listen to somebody else's radio program. Because this morning we're going off into a complete different world. When I worked in Las Vegas, and for a number of years I did the program in Las Vegas, uh, from the Union Plaza Hotel, it was called at that time. And one night when I was doing a show, this very night, as a matter of fact, a lady uh, called up and claimed to be a witch. She gave me some very, very disconcerting information, personal knowledge, which I actually bleeped off the air. It was so personal, I couldn't believe that she could possibly, possibly know these things about me. And um, toward the end of the call, she said she was going to come and leave something for me. Well, she left me a Ouija board, an ancient, ancient, ancient Ouija board. I have never, nor will I to this day, tell you what, is a, what has happened to that Ouija board. But when you call upon spirits, when you call upon the dark side, and you do it with something, an instrument, it does not matter, you'd better be damn careful what you're doing. Ouija boards are an opening. They're an opening into a world where there are things that you may not really wish to meet. So my advice to you, without telling you the detailed story of this board, which is frightening, my advice to you is do not play with Ouija boards. It's like opening a door, and you just don't know what's going to walk through. West of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hi. Art. Yes. Hello. How are you doing? Okay. You're going to have to get into that phone and yell at us. Um. All right. How's this? I'm much better. All right. Thank you. Uh, Where are you? I'm in Spokane. Spokane, Washington. KPA. Mighty KPA. You bet. <laughs> uh, I have a story for you. <laughs> all right. Go ahead. It's a doozy. Um, about a year ago, I was staying at a friend's house up in Newport. Mm-hmm. And um, we were sitting down in the basement, right? Yes. And we were sitting there smoking cigarettes and talking back and forth. Doing guy stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I was sitting there, and I was watching my smoke for my cigarette go up, and all of a sudden I seen a face kind of appear into it, you know, the smoke going up into the air. Mm -hmm. And I asked my friend, you know, do you see it? And he's like, yeah. <laughs> and it smiled, kind of, and then... It smiled? Yeah, it just smiled. And now, I could understand uh, people blow smoke rings. Yeah. I could even understand blowing a face, but I can't understand it smiling. Yeah, it, it, it just kind of formed into a face. It was uh -huh. the strangest thing I've ever... <laughs> it, I still get shivers now. I, and it smiled at you. Yes. <laughs> well, it's better to frown. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, what happened to it then? Did it? It, it just kind of dissipated, dissipated really slowly. God, that's weird. He's told me about stories about seeing things in his house before too. So. Well, I'll tell you then a little story. I have a photograph. Thank you very much for the call. I have a photograph of a ghost, a real ghost. Um. It might be a wonderful night for some of you to get this photograph. If you have a computer and a modem, we've got a bulletin board service, and you can go in and get a photograph of this ghost. Actually, there are several ghost photographs. Oh, by the way, my guest this last Sunday on Dreamland sent me a photograph of a tornadic ghost. I don't know if that's a word, but it Look, it is obviously some sort of plasma material uh, at the top of a staircase in the shape of a tornado. Now, down toward the bottom of the tornado, it's translucent. In other words, you can begin to look through it and see the stairs. It's the damnedest thing you've ever seen. I'm going to get that one up on the bulletin board for you as soon as they send it to me to scan. I've got a scan of it right now. 
but I want to be able to scan it myself at a higher resolution rate. If you want to see a ghost, there is a man in Arizona who uh, was a stone mason. He built stone, you know, he did basements. And he did a wine cellar for a fellow in about a hundred year old house. He um, was very proud of the work that he did. And when he was done, he took a photograph of his stone masonry work. It was beautiful. Only thing is, when the picture came out, quite clearly a translucent being appeared in the photograph. And it was captured very, very well on film. And we have published this photograph in our newsletter. And I might add, I've got it on our bulletin board. So if you want to download the picture of the ghost, you can call area code 702-727-1709, 24 hours a day. Let me give that number to you again. 702-727-1709. And um, if you're able to download with Zmodem protocol, you can download a photograph of this ghost. You take a look. There's a face. There's a body. There's arms. There's legs. It's a ghost. It's clear. It's in color. There is no mistake about it. There is some sort of spirit, some sort of entity in that photograph, and you're welcome to download it and take a look for yourself. We do a lot of that. We try to make some of this material available to you, so it does not all have to be the theater of the mind. That's what radio is. I want you to be able to see what I see so that you can see that I'm not totally crazy. West of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hello. Hi, Art. This is uh, Aaron calling from Los Banos, California. Hi. Hi. I have a really good ghost story I wanted to tell you. Let her go. Okay. This story happened in 1951. It was given to me by my father, and it happened to his cousin named Norbert. And um, he was at a movie theater and um, in Morgan Hill, California, and he was leaving, going towards San Jose. And there's a stretch of road they call Monterey Highway that they called uh, the Blood Alley. And um, one night after the uh, movie was done, he was heading home to San Jose, heading north. Sure. And uh, he was going about 45 miles an hour in his uh, old car. I know the road, by the way. Yeah. And there's a little highway. And, and, um, and while he was going up there, he saw this you know, beautiful young-looking lady on the side of the road and walking really slowly. And he kind of slowed down, and he was looking over at her. And, and um, she had a beautiful white dress on, and, and she was looking down. And um, he slowly passed her, and he looked in his rearview mirror, and, and he saw her, and, and, and uh, he slowed down a little bit more and was going, you know, 15, 10 miles an hour. And, and for some reason, he, he got a really nervous feeling inside, and, and he, slowly, he slowly sped up because he was scared. He didn't know, you know exactly what it was. And, uh, you know, what the, if, if it was something different, he got a different feeling inside. Mm -hmm. And, um, well, he said it, he, he sped up a little bit and he was going about 35, 40 miles an hour and he happened to look back again and, uh, it didn't go any further away. It wasn't leaving. And that, that really started. You mean to, the lady in the white dress was as close to him? Yes. As, uh -huh. as it was the first time he saw her. Uh huh. And he really started getting nervous. And, um, well, he, he put his foot on the pedal and got up to about 50, 55 miles an hour. Sure. And he looked in the mirror, and it wasn't any... As a matter of fact, it was getting closer to him. <laughs> this is, it was getting closer to his car. Really? On the passenger side. There are many, sir, that have died on that road. Yes, very. It was, there was a lot of fatal accidents uh, back in the 50s and, and earlier on and later on also. And... Um, and as he got up to speed, he started really stepping on. He was frightened now. By this time, he was really frightened. He was going, you know, to tipping the car out to, I guess, 70, 75 miles an hour is what he said. That, and, uh, that, that'd be my reaction. Yeah, yeah. He was really moving now. I'm the let's get out of here kind of person. Yes, yes. And he looked in the mirror this time. And um, he, he looked in the, as a matter of fact, he didn't look in the mirror. He looked over to his right side where his little side mirror was, you know, mm -hmm. to get a better picture. And, uh, you know, the worst thing possibly happened that he thought happened. 
and uh, there was a white dress floating next to the car. Mm. And when he looked at the window, he said he saw a face of a skeleton with white straw hair looking at him with its mouth opened. And he was so frightened that he could not believe it. He slammed his brakes on in the middle of the road. It was late at night. In the middle of the road, slammed his brakes on, uh, you know, closed his eyes as tight as he could, said a prayer. And uh, when he looked back, it was gone. He turned around and uh, went back to his to his uh, mother's house, which was about so twenty miles the other way, and and didn't go look back at all. And and uh, he went home and he told the story and uh, told it to the whole family. And he he uh, well as far as he, as far as I know, he never went down that road again as, if if he could. These things change your life forever. It's, yes. You know, it's thank you very much for the call. It's one thing to tell them. It's another to really experience them. When you do, it changes your life forever and ever. Because it does not matter what anybody else believes or chuckles about or laughs about. If you experience something like that, you're never, ever going to be the same. West of the Rockies, you're on the air. Good morning. Good morning. This is Dennis from Vancouver. Um, uh, Washington? Yes. All right. Um... Let's see, I've got a ghost story. Um, I, well, sort of a ghost story. Almost sort of? A ghost, almost a, almost ghost a ghost story. Look, that's um, like being almost pregnant. Either, <clears throat> either you're a spirit or you're a physical entity. It's one or the other. Well, uh, let me, I'll explain it and All right. I'll go from there. All right, then um, maybe I can tell you. Um, I was uh, up in Yosemite, uh, you know, National Park in California. Yes. Um, and... Doing a Ouija board, uh, and here we go. yeah, uh, uh huh. Um, there were, I guess, about ten or twelve people in the room. Uh, there was only two of us on the board. The other people were, you know, standing around watching, mm. uh, contributing their energy. Mm. Um, and we got uh, something that uh, came across as being, you know, negative. I don't necessarily want to say evil, but definitely negative oriented. Do you want to tell us what it was? Um, well, it wouldn't give us a name, but the impression that I have was that it was something higher up than just an ordinary demon. Um, it was very strong, um, very intelligent. Now, was this manifesting itself simply through moving on the Ouija board and spelling things out, or was um, it... Um, that's the way it started. Um... Okay. We were, you know, asking questions of it. You know, at first we didn't know that it was evil, but, you know, having done the Ouija board for several years uh, prior to that, you know, I've, we've learned to ask appropriate questions to determine whether it's a positive or a negative entity. Mm. And after having determined that it was a negative entity, we were going to stop, but the rest of the people in the room wanted to continue because they were fascinated. Um, so we went ahead and continued with it, which, of course, was our mistake. But, <laughs> um, after a while, it told us to turn the lights off. Oh, so, it did. And, and you yeah. listened, right? Yeah, we turned the uh -huh. lights off. We turned the candle on. All right, I'll tell you, lit a candle. Lit a candle. I'll tell you what. I'm coming up on a break. I want you to hold this story for the break, all right? Okay. All right, stay right where you are. Oh, no problem. Um... Uh, let's see where was I? Um, the uh, it asked us to turn the lights off, um, so we lit a candle and uh, we did turn the lights off. Um, Bad move. Yeah, well, we we found that out um, the hard way. Um, we continued, you know, speaking with it for about a minute or so. Um, it. Yeah, it. Um, unbeknownst to us, um, back behind the group. Uh, towards the corner of a room, um, a light started to form uh, just uh, in the middle of the air. Um, it started off real small, but it was real bright. It was actually lighting up the room. Right. Um, the room got real cold, real fast. Um, there was no bad smell or anything, but it, it was quite cold all of a sudden. That would be, um, that'd be enough for me. Now, what I want to know, first of all, before you continue is, I'd be out of there. I mean, in a flash, I'd be out of there. Light begins to form where there ought not be light. The room gets cold. That would be all I'd need. 
Um, well, um, since um, my friend and I um, had been doing it for, you know, on a semi-regular basis for a couple of years, you know, we were fairly uh, fluent, at least up to that point. We hadn't, you know, gotten anything that strong uh, before, but, uh, you know, we pretty much knew how to, you know, deal with it once it got to that point. Mm. Um you know, my friend started getting sick to his stomach. I started, you know, getting a little bit of a headache. Um, so we we stopped, you know, uh, with the board itself and basically moved back away, relaxed ourselves, uh, started saying some prayers, started, uh, um, well, at least I started imagining uh, a golden uh, light around myself, um, you know, which is what I consider a protective uh, light. And, you know, went from there and we just left the board alone and the light did uh, fade. We turned on the, the room lights itself and, you know, the light just, you know, fade, faded out. And well, that's good. Uh, there are a lot of people who would say to you, you should have been praying in the first time, uh, place, not messing around with the Ouija board. Well, um... Because you know what can happen, sir? Oh, yeah. Um, I you know can, that... You can bring something like that into yeah. this world or across from wherever it comes from and uh, you can put your Ouija board away and it won't matter because it's in right right yeah once it's done its full transformation crossover yeah um, but we managed to stop it in time so how uh, what would you advise people out there about Ouija boards um, well first of all there there are several good books out there if you're really determined to use one um, read the books on it first. Um, the best thing to do is to, you know, one of the one of the most common questions, if you get a negative oriented spirit, one of the most common questions that it will ask is, "Can I come in?" And <laughs> never think that it's referring to coming into the room or into your home or whatever. When it's asking that question, it's wanting to come into you, uh, oh. and you always say no and if you get a question like that I would suggest that you stop and don't mess with it anymore okie dokie thank you uh, very much for the call there are many out there who uh, probably ought not mess around with this kind of thing at all it's very serious it's not a joke a Ouija board is simply an instrument uh, in my opinion now it may be a particularly powerful instrument but you can invite these sorts of forces in with or without a Ouija board. And my advice to you is, don't do it. Like an unwelcome uh, in-law coming to visit, it might not leave. East of the Rockies, you're on the air. Top of the morning to you. Hello, Art. This is Jeff. I'm uh, calling from Denver. Denver, yes, sir. K how I imagine. Yes, and uh, I have a true fact uh, story that I can relate to you about spirits, ghosts, or whatever you want to call them. Let her rip. Um, I was living in an apartment complex, and uh, a guy came over to me. I met him just inadvertently, and uh, I was working in the legal field, and he asked me to check out whether or not his wife had been married before, and uh -huh. I did that. And I gave him information, and he came over to my apartment. Had had she been? I just want to know. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah, it was big me. Um, oh, oh my. He was married to her for ten years, and she never got a divorce. Mm -hmm. So he came over to my house. He was crying. Um, sure. I took him over to his apartment, tried to calm him down, and he went into a rage. He started tearing telephones out of the wall, breaking lamps, tables, etc. And then he came at me like he was going to attack me. He got right up close to me, and he fell down, and he started to convulse. And I thought, well, this guy has epilepsy or something. Sure. And then he jumped up again and did the same thing again and went down like someone hit him in the head with the ball bat. And... Um, Wow. It was frightening. The hair on my head went up. His eyes were rolling back. He was foaming at the mouth. You're saying and it was like he, he was in combat with a with some horse. I don't know what was going on, but what I can say that really frightened me 
was he was speaking out of his own mouth and cursing me and doing all this, but there were multiple voices coming out. Sometimes there were one, sometimes it sounded like two or three or five or six. Mm. And then he he stopped breathing, and the guy was foaming at the mouth and that. Oh I, I went down, I checked his pulse and all that. I had to give him CPR, get him breathing again, and I had to run over. He pulled the phone out of the wall. I had to run over to the neighbors and ask them to call the cops and and... Then the uh, cops, the fire department, the uh, EMTs, all of them came over. They took him off to ER. And I thought, well, you know, when he was talking to me, it just, it was, it was horrible. It was something I can't even explain. What would there you was, say? Would you think he was possessed or was he being beaten by some outside force? Well, all I can say is there there were voices coming out of his body when his eyes were rolled back and he was foaming at the mouth, mouth he was writhing on the floor and there, sometimes it sounded like one person talking sometimes it sounded like five, four, oh you know, God. whatever talking and so I gave him the CPR they took him off and then that was about 11 o'clock at night and then about four in the morning they let him out of VR and he came back to my apartment and I said get out of here I don't want to talk to you I'm sure get, leave go now and then about five months after that I met him in a parking lot of a shopping center and I said you know do you realize what's going on do you do you understand and and he said yeah do you can you imagine what those cops did to my apartment? I said, the, the cops didn't do anything. You did that. And I, I talked with him for a while, and then he, he told me that he was an immigrant from France. He was in an orphanage in France, and um, as far as these convulsions and stuff, I asked him if he was epileptic or, or all that, and he said no. And I was talking with him, and then he said, uh, you know, I was in an orphanage in France, and two priests told me I was possessed. And I said, oh, gee whiz, and that was the end of it. I, I didn't talk to him after that. That's enough. All right, my friend, thank you. Uh, that's quite enough. Well, what to say about that? Uh, we were talking about inviting entities in a few moments ago. Maybe uh, on occasion they invite themselves in. Maybe on occasion, they take the minds of those who can be taken. Had you thought of that? Wildcard Line, you're on the air. Good morning. Good morning, our WBC Duluth Superior. Uh, in Wisconsin. Uh, actually, I'm in Duluth. But Duluth, it's... Minnesota. I'm sorry. Yeah. All right. Yeah, your Detroit station is coming through pretty good, too. All right. Say, are you going to tell us what happened to your uh, Ouija board? Absolutely not. Can't talk you into it, huh? No, that's one story I really won't tell. It scares me, and uh, I, I don't like telling it. Not not even on this day. It scares the hell out of me. That's one thing that really did scare me. And uh, that's so I so I warn people about Ouija boards. How about you? Do you have a story? Yeah, I got a quick one for you. All right. Uh, back in the fifties, my mom was seeing a, uh, a gentleman in her school. She was a junior in high school. They were, I guess, they were really. Um, in love with each other, this, that, and the other thing. And one night, she was uh, sleeping, and she just kind of stirred in bed, and she woke up and saw him standing in the room, her bedroom. She, what are you doing here? And he just kind of faded away. No. Oh. And the next day, she found out he was killed in a car accident. So. Oh, there's a lot of stories like that. There's a lot of stories. Thank you very much. Now, you see... I, I, I believe uh, we had Brad Steiger on a couple of weeks ago, and uh, actually we've been kind of doing the warm-up to Halloween for some time now. But there are many, many stories like that. It seems when many die, the energy that is us, the energy that may be our soul, our essence, whatever it is you want to call it, you give your own name to it, has something that it must say to somebody or that it has left behind. 
it must say it and somehow that energy either still here on earth or from elsewhere finds its way back long enough to assure the person that it loves or to pass a message that must be passed information that a loved one must have and somehow the energy makes it back don't ask me I just do talk shows east of the Rockies you're on the air hello thank you where are you pardon where are you uh, Corpus Christi Texas all right welcome welcome uh, yes I have a uh, uh several ghost stories, but I, I know I don't have that much time. No, give us your best. Oh, the best. Okay. Um, one time, my husband and I had a disagreement, and uh, he had been, you know, just frolicking and carrying on, and I'd about had it. And uh, I was very upset, and my mom told me, well, uh, you need to cool down, and so she said, let's go to this thrift store that happened to be in a, a hospital. And uh, we were walking down the corridor. Why is it that when women get upset, they go shopping? <laughs> it's true, isn't it? Uh, yeah, well, yeah, it is. Uh, but anyway, my mom and I were walking down the corridor, and uh, in the hospital, you hear the, the uh, there's like speakers, and there's like, uh, you know, Dr. Dr. Jones. Dr. On Jones four. wanted an ER, and you really don't pay attention to these things. That's right. And anyway, uh, I was upset, and she just calmed down. I said, no, this is it. I am upset. And nothing you can say, Mother, is going to change my mind. She says, well, I really think you need to cool down. I said, well, nope, that's it. At that point, um, we heard a voice walk by, and it asked, it just asked in a real deep voice, uh, where is, where, where did you leave Ben? And I didn't, we didn't pay any attention to it until we walked about uh, two feet. And then my mom and I looked at each other, and we turned around together, and we saw a tall, uh, almost Frankenstein stature man and a short man. And they both had on those white gowns, and their skin was gray tone. Mm -hmm. And we both looked at it, and then, and then I kept looking at it, and then the tall guy turns around in, in like a, a Frankenstein stance and looks directly into my eyes. And he lifts his head up just a bit, like telling me, you know, I'm going to get you because you're vulnerable, because you can be mine. And then he just turns around and he walks off with the other short guy. And we both looked at them and their skin tone was like, it was gray as if they were uh, had been dead for years and then I looked at my mom and she looks at me and she says make the sign of the cross you know we, I both made, we both made the sign of the cross and she says look when you're this upset with somebody the evil spirits know that you're vulnerable and at this point she says you need to cool down because this is how bad things happen. Well, I'll bet you if her first speech didn't work, this one did. Yeah, it, it, it well, I still haven't forgiven him, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but, but, uh, you uh, did calm down. Uh, oh, yeah, I did calm down. Uh, and, and, and there are, I just want to tell everybody that there are bad spirits out there. Yes. And that when you're being negative and, and you're vulnerable and you don't have the fear of Christ or something that's more powerful than them, then they can get you. But if you have, uh, if you can say a prayer right now and then. Uh, it's a matter of weakness. It's a matter of weakness, like you were saying. It's a matter of weakness, and they'll, they'll come right on in, and this is how bad things happen. It's, a, it's such a good point. Thank you. Uh, even if I were to relate it to what I do, and on this program, we talk about a million things. This is like any other, uh, not like any other program you've ever heard. We delve into areas that are there really is no explanation for it. I can't put it into words. You're just going to have to listen to the program, not just this one, but the one we do on a regular basis, and you'll begin to get the idea. We don't bore in. We're not like other talk shows. We don't bore in only on politics or anything else. We do whatever comes up on any given 
night. Top of the morning, you're on the air, coast to coast AM with Art Bell. Where are you calling from, please? Uh, hi, Art. Uh, Salt Lake City. Salt Lake City, yes. Uh, uh, listen, sir, I'd like to interject a note of caution uh, from the cultural mecca of all that is the United States. <laughs> right. um, first of all, if, if also before I can, with the death of uh, Vincent Price, I want to say you made it into my top four American heroes, sir. Oh well, thank you. All right. <laughs> anyway, listen, I had an experience with a Ouija board, and uh, just to, just a note that the uh, you know biblically, I don't know how you feel about Christianity. But the scriptures do tell us that uh, that ghosts, you know, the spirits of the dead do not come back uh, to haunt the living. Uh, in fact, they're demons uh, t- taking manifestations in order to fool uh, the relatives of those that have already passed on. So how, how then, if that's the case, do you account for some of the stories like we've heard this morning, the lady with the car and no brakes, spirits that seem to be those of departed uh, loved ones that are here to help? Well, a lot of times, you know, you don't have the full stories. A lot of a lot of these spirits may be, uh, you know, intending to, to appear as benevolent, uh, when in in fact the intentions may be very malign. I, I, that's not what I wanted to talk about. I want to give you my own experience very quickly. Sure. Uh, what I was doing is I was playing with a Ouija board alone, a uh, long, long time ago. Bad idea. Bad idea. And uh, I began having an argument with the planchette. Well, you know, I thought, oh, this is nonsense. This is my own energy. And, you know, there's nothing in this. <laughs> Uh, and at one point, every time that I would push the planchette to the S, the phone would ring. And so I asked the, you know, I asked the, the, the board if it were in fact ringing the phone, and it moves to the yes uh, position. Well, I ran across the room to answer the phone. The phone kept ringing, and there was this. It was a crackling line. It sounded the, the voice was distant, miles away, yes. uh, ancient voice, and it, it says, "You shall." And I, I didn't have the guts to listen to it. I hung the phone up. Phone up. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> For the next seven years, uh, this uh, you know phenomena have been uh, been happening in my life. Uh, for example, I'll pass by cars. Haven't you forevermore, if I can stop you, wondered? You shall, you shall, you shall what? I don't know. I don't know. How could you hang up? <laughs> I, I really did not want to know. I didn't want to hear what it was going to say. Okay. Uh, but it is a warning. Don't uh, you know the the I, I've had an aversion to the uh, paraphernalia of the occult ever since. And uh, I think, you know, there, there is... Um, I have a lot of respect for Ouija boards. I've had an experience with one myself, and I won't even talk about it. Well, as I said, it may answer your question of whether or not you would spin around and see what it was there that was manifesting itself uh, or going to a haunted house. I've done it in, uh, in, since the experience, but uh, in every case, I've, I've rooted. I appreciate your call, sir. Certainly. Have a good morning. All right. That's Salt Lake City with a caution, and a, and a well-given caution it was, too, I might add. Well, given caution, you be careful. There are lots of things out there that we don't understand, and I think I think the possibility exists that a Ouija board is just inviting trouble. Line three, you're on the air. Uh, hi, Art. How you doing? Fine, sir. Welcome to the program. Real good uh, show tonight. Thank you. Hey, I have a question. <clears throat> that caller that called uh, last hour about the glowing gravestone. Yes. Um, there's a phenomenon called St. Elmo's Fire. Yes. Mm-hmm. But St. Elmo's Fire um, do, it tends not to return uh, predictably to the same place again and again. Yeah. Uh, during a... Um, not saying it wasn't. Uh, I'm just saying that uh, on many occasions the caller said he saw this glowing gravestone and uh, uh, that it would be St. Elmo's Fire that many times is not probable. That's true, but that's, that'd be, be something you really want, would want to see once, and I think that'd be about it. That'd do me. Yeah. Well, take it easy. All right. Thank you. Just wanted to suggest that possibility, I guess. Hi, on the first time caller line, you're on the air. Yeah, hi. Um, where, where are you, sir? I'm in Alaska. Alaska. All right. I was in the United States Marine Corps, and I was a sniper. And I was stayed, I went to Granada, and I got hit in the knee with a bullet. And my, from pictures in the family, it was my great great grandfather in a Civil War uniform that sat down and froze my leg. And the Granada is a jungle, and he said, "Everything will be okay, boy. Everything will be okay." And this first time I've talked about it, other than to the military psychologist, and all right, if, let's let, if you don't mind, I, I I want to be sure I understand. You were part of the invasion force. You were a sniper. You were in Grenada. 
Yeah, my job, my my job was to make sure nobody, no, none of the Cubans, got into the students at the university. Uh huh. And so you were stationed there, and you were just going to take them out if you had to. Yes. And and uh, the anti-sniper got me. My a gunner ended up getting him. Hit you in the leg. Yeah, in the in the knee. In the oh god. Well, it went from the knee. It ended my military career. Went from the knee up around um, the pelvis bone and out the other ankle. The bullet traveled my whole my all, all. What a horrible injury. Yeah, it hurt very much. So. And so you were laying there. Yeah, I you all instantly fell. There was nothing I could do. And, like I say, through pictures of the family photo album, it was my, I think it'd be three great, he was in the Civil War, and it'd be three great grandfathers, sat down and froze my leg. There, my leg was frozen, not cauterized, it was frozen. Frozen. The whole wound, which is something nobody's been able to explain. And he said, everything will be okay now, boy. Everything will be okay. And left? Yeah. That's and, eerie. What did the medics say? Medics? They were just asking me what we'd done, how we'd done this, um, where did we get ice. Um, nobody could understand. The, the psychologist told me that it was uh, um, in the lust of battle and that I'd lost a lot of blood and that I wasn't sure what, I, what was happening. But um, my spotter, who was also a sniper, he felt something cold as he was taking the other man out. And he has shot before. It wasn't, you know... It's not the coldness you feel when you take a man out. I understand. It was completely different, and, you know, I was scared, but at the same time, there was this great uh, feeling of purity and uh, just the joy of knowing that I had a family member there, because I really thought that I'd, you know, the pain that I was feeling, I knew where I was, I knew where the bullet went out. I didn't know what the damages were. That's the most incredible story I've ever heard, and I really appreciate your call, sir. Thank you. Wow. For that one, I'll take a quick break. We'll be right back. Good morning. You're on the air. Coast this would have been. You were a dial tone. Spirit of a dial tone. Wild card line three, you're on the air. Hello, Art. Hello. Yes, I have a... This is Mark from Anderson, California. Hi, Mark. Yeah, I had a situation that uh, happened a couple years ago. I was sitting at a friend's house, and it was about 1 o'clock in the morning. And um, this, we were sitting there talking about, you know, people that we've known throughout our lives. And uh, I was sitting in a chair, and all of a sudden, I bent over in extreme pain. I mean, it took me to the floor, out of the chair onto the floor on my right side. And then I kind of got a headache, and we were just, for some reason, my friend Craig and I both noted the time. Right. The thing that was strange was the next day, uh, my friend Ed was looking through the paper and noticed that uh, a friend of mine had been killed. Uh, she was, I used to work at a, at a convenience store, and she used to come in, and her parents didn't really listen to her, and I was kind of like her mentor. I was her sounding board, you know, whenever she had problems. Mm-hmm. And uh, he told me that this young lady named Kelly had died. And uh, I knew the area where she had, she had been hit by a car. I knew that much. And I went out into the area, and I was just kind of walking around. By feel, I found the area where she was hit, just through whatever I have on, in myself that told me this you, is it. You just knew it. I just knew it. And uh, we were kind of kicking around, and I, I we saw one of the sheriff's deputies uh, car go up there and I went and flagged him down and asked him if he had been working the night she got killed mm -hmm. and he said yes and I told him that she was a friend of mine and I said to him uh, I know this is going to sound morbid but what side of her body did the truck impact her on he told me that the initial strike hit her on the right side fracturing her pelvis she flipped up over the truck and uh, landed on her head and was killed immediately mm. Now, this was within five minutes. This is the night before that I had fell over. This was in five minutes of that time that, that the time of death was pronounced. And my belief is that she said, uh, came to me and said goodbye. And it was just, it was just too weird. And a friend of mine 
if you'd like, he he was there. He I told him if if he would like, he could call back and verify because he was there, and he was kind of freaked out as the couple of days where we talked to the sheriff's deputy and stuff. I just, I'm I'm just convinced it happens. People and, come uh, back. Pe people do come back, and they do say goodbye. Uh, my friend and I are researching a book on. Uh, we're going to be writing a book basically on poltergeist and and demonology. And I was wondering if uh, either I could give you an address that people could write letters to, because we're we're looking for input, or if you'd prefer that I mailed it to you. Well, if I were you, I would roll a tape on this program. Okay. Well, I realize. Right. But right. I... Otherwise, I'll see what I can do. Okay. All right. Thank you. You might want to. Uh, you really might want to get a copy of this program. Because these are some of the most serious stories that I've ever heard. And I don't know where you could go to get a better rendition of stuff that'll just put the hackles right down your back. <laughs> this is pretty good this morning. Good morning. On our first time caller line, you're on the air. Where are you, please? I'm calling from Denver. Welcome to the program. Thank you. Art, I want to tell you that that Ouija board... If you mess with that, it happened to me when I was nine years old. It's an entrance for a satanic spirit to enter your body. And Dr. Ken Olson, who was on the Maury Porvich show... Maury Povich. Yes, sir. Thank you. He was the person that released that terrible demonic spirit. And it happened to me when I was nine through age 54, the worst type of satanic deprivation that could ever enter a human body. And I'm telling you, leave it alone. Don't allow anyone to touch or be around or play around with a Ouija board. Because if you don't have someone like Dr. Ken Olson, who is uh, an exorcist, a vessel of Jesus Christ, he is an instrument of God to pray to release that. It can cause the worst type of nightmares that you could ever have and the worst type of life that you could ever have. And I want to tell you the truth and your listeners to never be around the Ouija board or allow any type of activity. Well, I'm, I'm glad you gave everybody else the caution. I don't need it. Believe me, I've got that caution. Thank you for the call. That's Denver. And heed what that man says. Ouija boards are bizarre things that do seem to, you know, I hate to use the word door, open the door, but open a channel, open a conduit for things that you really don't want around you. Line three, you're on the air. Good morning. Okay, I'm calling from Reno. Reno, oh, KOH, yes. And this concerns the old mining camp of Virginia City. Uh, <coughs> well, the big mines, <coughs> excuse me, the big mines been abandoned for many years, but there are 700 miles of shafts and tunnels and drifts and windows underground. Yes, sir. 200 miles in a big labyrinth. And uh, I was having lunch with my parents, in Virginia City, and knocking at the back door, and he came an old friend of my dad's, very agitated, a big lump in his forehead, and a split was cut, and the blood was coming down, so folks passed him up, and he, like many of the old retired miners, he liked to roam through the abandoned mines, pick samples out and stuff like that, and he was at, in the mine called the Ward Mine, Southeast of Virginia City. Is that W A R D Ward? Yes. Uh huh. And uh, I think I just he had his carbide lamp in his hat. Uh, and he turned the corner and came come down a corridor. There, you know, kind of illuminated, was a man buried up over, almost to his head in Cavian dirt. His arms were free and he was shaking them and waving his head back and forth. He, face was contorted and uh, obviously a cave in there. <clears throat> Our friend was so startled that he turned around and started to run. He, 
a timber, timber over the top, over the roof of the mine, and it ran into it. That's where he got that knock on the head. Well, when he told the story around town, people just laughed and said, well, he must have bumped his head first and had a... Yeah, sure, sure. Sure. Uh, Several years later, some mining engineers were looking at the maps of the old mines, and they were examining the ward, and it has all the details. And he said, my goodness, there was a fatal cave-in in the tunnel number so-and-so, and that was the one. That is really eerie. It's true. That's really eerie. I understand, sir. I understand. I really thank you for the call. Okay, Art. And uh, it, so there you go. Uh, there is a mining story. A man buried almost to his head who had died violently and quickly and unexpectedly. The worrisome part, of course, of that is if that is to be the manner of your death or mine, would we... Would we be forever trapped here on earth in such a, uh, destined to repeat such a gruesome experience again and again, though it wasn't something that was uh, from uh, some deviant behavior that we had exhibited, but simply the unlucky moment of a mine caving in on us? Line one, you're on the air. Morning, Art. I thought I'd give you a call. Been listening to these programs. I'll give you an experience. Uh, a couple of years ago, coming in on uh, 163, I was approaching uh, Level Canyon Turnoff. And you know where the old Christmas tree used to be? Yes. I... Okay. It was right after that fire. Uh, it was lightning, and we were joking around as we were driving. And I said, you know, and defiantly, like, just show me that you're out there. Make me a believer. And uh, about that time, uh, literally, uh, two bolts of lightning came right across the front of the truck and, and hit the side of the road about, oh, maybe 400 yards up from where we were traveling. And it was just like out of a Star War. I mean, it was one bolt from one side of the car and one from the other. And uh, <laughs> we pulled over and sat there for about five minutes and uh, drove on up to mountain pass and like I said uh, tell me something had you said this mentally crying out or had you said it aloud we were talking about and I in in the conversation we said I said it out loud I told him I said Bill I said you know let, let, just show me out there God if you're out there make me a believer and you know a couple strikes around us but then uh, you know well that was close well uh, Give me another sign. Make sure that I, that you you can hear me. You know. Well, I'm glad you didn't ask for absolute proof. But... <laughs> well, <laughs> tell you what, I've never asked for something again that I didn't want. <laughs> oh man, what a story! Now, how has this affected you, and how has it affected Bill? Well, we talk about it uh, occasionally, and uh, like I said, we just uh, look at each other and shake our heads. Uh, and like I said, I, it, it, to me, it's a thing in life now. I don't ask for anything. That you know, in a joking manner anymore. Uh, it's I, been said. Be careful what you wish for. Yeah, it might come true. <laughs> Thank you for the story. Take care. That's uh, <laughs> that was quite a story. That's a local story too. That's a road I travel every day, and it's a dark road, and it's a dangerous road that I travel. Highway 160. I do about 120 miles a day on it. There have been a lot of people killed. There are a lot of crosses placed on the uh, roadside to designate the place where it's occurred. I've never seen anything. Not yet. Good morning. On the first time caller line, you're on the air. Hi, I'm calling from Genoa, Nevada. Uh, where in Nevada? Genoa. Genoa, Nevada. Oh, Genoa. Gen where is that? It is um, just about 10 miles south of Carson City. Uh, it's the first Nevada settlement. Very good. And um, anyway, I was, uh, this was about two years ago, my story, uh, I'm a recovering alcoholic, and uh, I was going out with a girl who had just got into recovery, and we were in um, counseling, and we were doing a bunch of inner child work. Um, and, you know, one of the reasons we got along so well, our therapist says, is because we, we played so well together. Well, this whole relationship, went sour 
and she began dating this other man, and uh, they were going to move to Cleveland, Ohio. And um, anyway, so one night, I'm laying in my bed, and, and this therapy work that we're doing with inner child, you have to close your eyes and, and imagine this child and, and uh, you know, what, what that child was doing at the time. And, and I was laying in my bed, and my eyes were open, and all of a sudden, this little girl about eight years old um she had a pixie haircut and kind of a she was wearing shorts and a and a small halter top came up and she was standing right next to my bed and my eyes were wide open and um it was that my girlfriend is like you know a smaller version of her right and yes. and this girl without opening her her lips or anything said you know to me i've come to play with Chris, who was like, and that's my name and, and my inner child. So, anyway, so anyway, so this this little girl is standing there, and and she's talking to me. She says, "And I'm leaving, I'm moving, and I wanted to come and play." And so she starts taking off with this other little kid. I, you know, I'm assuming it was me. And and they're running, uh, and all of a sudden, then I don't see walls in my room or anything. I just see them out like in a a field running. Wow. And and I keep saying out loud to this girl who I was I was you know had since not dated Gary do you do you feel this I was wondering if there was a connection between her and me right and I kept saying do, do you do you feel this are you here do you you know <laughs> are you seeing what I'm seeing and then after they got done playing this and this went on for uh, I'm gonna guess 10 minutes and then the little girl walked back up and and said thank you and that she was leaving and um, that you know, hopefully she would come back to see us again. And I and I had told her. I mean, I'm talking directly to this. She was transparent, but it, she was still standing right there. And and I was telling her, I said, um, you can come back anytime you want. It was not a fear thing. I was not afraid. Why not? Uh, well, because she was. Because she was, I guess because it was somebody you knew, somebody you know. Right, I think so. And she was just. <laughs> she was just. You know, eight years old, nine years old, and 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 just real shy, and and you know. I would like to think I could react as you did. I, I'm going to have to leave the line because we're out of okay. time. I thank you for the call. I would like to think that I would react that way, and maybe, maybe, if it was somebody that I had known, somebody that I was comfortable with, and the experience felt benign, maybe I would be, but I'm I'm not sure of that. <laughs> Line two, you're on the air. Uh, hi, Art. Hello. Hello, in Las Vegas. Yes, sir. Uh, I'd like to relate an experience I had, but first I'd like to see if I can jog your memory. The last time I called in was oh, a year or so ago, and you had put out a question over the year, and I think the, it's somewhat apropos tonight also. Um, the question that you put out was uh, that night was, uh, what do you think the purpose of life is? That's right. And I, uh, my call you was a story that was related to me and I told you at the time I wasn't sure I believed or accepted it is that we were this is where I want to see if I can jog your memory uh, we were all gods and goddesses and uh, we had everything and could do everything and so we decided to play a game and the game was called life and part of the rules of the game I remember yeah okay uh, you're right the question and tonight's topic go together very well go ahead now uh -huh. um, some years ago, uh, in the late 60s, I was living in Los Angeles, and uh, uh, I uh, made a couple of acquaintances. They had a small business going. Uh, one was a writer, the other was a printer, an artist, and uh, they had uh, made up copies of a poster that they uh, uh, came up with. And uh, in our dealings, they, they asked that I would I sell the poster for them. I agreed to, and for a while I sold it around the Los Angeles area to bookstores and so on. And uh, then they suggested, why don't you make a trip to, to the Bay Area, to San Francisco, and see uh, how it'll go up there. Uh, it was during the time of the Haight-Ashbury thing, during the hippie days. Oh, I remember the time. Uh -huh. And so I, I agreed to make the trip, and I went up there, and the evening that I arrived in San Francisco, I, uh, uh, before I decided to get a hotel, I decided to eat in a restaurant, and then after that I went to a, uh, a piano bar, I thought I'd uh, just kind of rest for a while, and... Uh, listen to some music and uh, 
a fellow sitting next to me at the piano bar uh, and I got to talking and uh, um, I let him know that I was up from uh, L.A. and uh, he said, well, you don't have to get a hotel room. Uh, there's a house that I know of that uh, isn't being occupied right now and uh, I've got the key and you're welcome to use it. I went to the house and it was on a street of the old Victorian uh, homes that are so frequent in San Francisco. Uh, this was about... Uh, the middle of the block and it was the only one in the whole row of Victorian homes on that block that was set in from the others um, I thought that was interesting uh, I went up the porch and uh, unlocked the door and turned on the light and went inside right. but as I entered I got a very uneasy feeling in, in my gut and as I got further into the place into the house uh, uh, that feeling got stronger uh, and I just figure, oh, well. Uneasy as in you shouldn't be there? Yeah, exactly. All right, listen, we're short on time, so. Oh, I wanted to get the story out. Uh, anyway, so I uh, I walked uh, into the kitchen, and uh, which was all the way in the back, and uh, I, there were uh, windowed, uh, windows, uh, multi-windows and, and a window door, and I opened the door and was going to step out, and I paused, and I looked down, and were no stairs and it was about 10 feet straight down uh, I then pr pr proceeded into uh, the living room and uh, uh, I've got a much more uneasy feeling um, we're about to run out of time I, I went up the stairs slowly and I got to the head of the stairs there were two bedrooms I could not enter either of the bedrooms I just had to leave uh, it was became unbearable to be there even though my mind was saying there's nothing wrong here there's nothing wrong here I just couldn't stay it was extremely uncomfortable all right, we're going to have to hold it there. Thank you very much for the call, and good morning. Have you ever had that happen? Something inside of you so strongly compelling you to leave, telling you that something is urgently, terribly, profoundly wrong. Good morning. First time caller line, you're on the air. Good morning, Art Bell. Yes, where are you calling from? This is Pablo. Pablo in Canada. Yes, you have something that relates to all this, Pavo? Yes, I do. That's amazing. All right, let's hear it. Usually, people that enter into um, my domain receive an eerie feeling when they see all of the uh, murals and... I can only imagine what your area looks like, Pavo. But there's one room in my house that is a shrine... Uh, to you know who Hitler yes and when you walk in the presence is so strong that the power you feel the power thank you Pavel that that is Pavel who is in Canada he's up in uh, in the Edmonton area I believe and Pavel is a Nazi and he really is a Nazi and uh, he was talking about what he does now and his shrine uh, I don't have to be there to imagine what it is like and I can easily imagine that it imparts the exact feeling that he was just talking about eerie wild card line three you're on the air good morning morning Mr. Bell calling from Albuquerque Albuquerque yes sir uh, just a real quick story, not quite as heavy as most of them, but I guess I was about two years old when my, my father told me about this. Uh, uh, I had a favorite uncle, and I I can't really remember his name right now because, again, I was two years old. But, well, let's call him Uncle Joe. So uh, I guess out of the clear blue sky one day, I just I wanted to go see Uncle Joe, and they said, no, no, it's too far away. It's about a 100-mile drive or something. This was back in the 50s, and... Uh, and I guess I had a fit, according to my father, and I just had to go see Uncle Joe, you know. So they decided that weekend to go see Uncle Joe, so we went up there and had a nice visit. And then a couple weeks later, he died, you know. So so then, uh, you know, this, that, that uh, a short time later, say a couple months later, I wanted to go see another relative. My, and, of course, they didn't die, but my dad said he just about, they just about went crazy because they, they were afraid that something was going to go wrong with this role. In other words, they, they figured that you, you had some precognitive. Yeah, they said after the first time, they figured they were, they were afraid to pick up anybody's name. So it's just a short little story. Oh, I, well, I appreciate it. Get off the air because you get a lot of good stories. I don't want to. Yeah, they've been some, there really have been some tremendous. Excellent show. Thank you. 
<laughs> yeah, I want to go see Uncle So and So. Quickly call him, tell him to stay in bed today. <laughs> I don't think it works like that, though. Do you? I think that things that are going to happen happen. Don't you? Or do you think that uh, that with the help of somebody who's been around before, some things that might happen otherwise would not or can be avoided? Like the lady with the story about the brakes. Line three, you're on the air. Hello, line three. No, you're not. Wild card, line three, you're on the air. Card. Yes. I'm calling from Anchorage, Alaska. Welcome to the program. All right. Um, I had a. I was going to tell you a little story here that happened to me about three years ago. All right. Go right ahead. All right. Um, I was um, living. I was staying with some friends, and um, my mom lives up here in Anchorage, or in King Salmon, and um, she was telling me that she had a a bad dream or whatever about me um, getting a wreck over the weekend. And I was like, well, you know, just just you know, shrugged it off or whatever, and didn't think about it. And um, sure enough, the weekend came around, and I uh, got in a really serious motorcycle wreck. Oh. And uh, got, was in the hospital for a long time and everything. And uh, um, she uh, was in the hospital, and she was like, you know, she just couldn't believe that it actually happened or whatever. And she was sitting there trying to explain to me what had, uh, what really had went on that night that she had the bad dream, and she said that uh, someone had actually came to her that night while she was asleep or whatever and, and woke her up. She didn't know who it was, no face or nothing or any kind of, and um, told him, told my mother that I was going to die on, at the end of the week. Really. And uh, and she told me I was just supposed to get in a wreck or whatever, just to try to be careful. And she didn't tell me I was going to die. She just told me I was going to get in a wreck. And uh, she, and she said she was like, "Tell me what." Why? Why? If she would tell you that, I'm curious. If she would tell you, "Be careful, or you're going to be in a wreck," uh, and she would go to all that trouble to caution you about that, why wouldn't she give you the original message and try to warn you away, or try to change what was to be? Um, I, I really don't know. I'm. I'm just assuming she didn't probably want to worry me or scare me or whatever because she, she's had these, uh, I'm not saying she's psychic or nothing, but she's done the same thing to her real father. Her real father was really dead, deadly sick down in Florida and uh, no one knew anything about her. So she called down and talked to one of her sisters to go tell him to check on her, check on him. And uh, sure enough, he went there, she went, they went to check out, to check him out and everything. And he was, uh, they found him on the floor, you know, and he was, he was not in the greatest health or whatever. And it's just been a couple of weird coincidences or just something that's definite. She's definitely got some sort of weird power. Not power, but uh, just some sort of gift, I guess, or something. I take it any similar caution given now, you would really... Uh... <laughs> Most definitely, yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much for the call. All right. You take care from the state of Alaska. Line one, you're on the air. Oh, it's me? It's you. Oh, hi. Um, hi my name's Don. I'm a first-time caller. Hi, Don. And uh, I'm coming from Vegas. I used to live out there in Pahrump, and uh, and oh, I have two quick stories, and both of them happened while I was living out there. All right, go right ahead. It is a strange place. Yeah. Uh, well, one of them, the first, first one uh, is I was dating this girl in St. George, and uh, I happened to be there late for one weekend, and I had to be back in Pahrump for a... Uh, for work the next morning, but I was there too late, so I stayed the night at her house in uh, their guest bedroom. And I had I had already gone to sleep. You know, the doors were shut and the lights were off and everything. Right. And uh, for some reason, I woke up and I looked towards the door, and uh, I could see I don't know three, four, or five people looking in at me. So I rubbed my eyes because I thought you know I was seeing something. And after I rubbed my eyes. I saw someone standing next to me in the bed, hmm. and uh, and you know how you can see, uh, in a, even though it's dark, you can still kind of see him. Yes. He had, uh, I could tell he was blonde, and and I was, I was about to say say something to him, ask him what he's doing, because it didn't appear to me that he might be a spirit. Yes. And just before I started to talk, he proceeded to fall on top of me, and. And I jumped back 
and so you felt the physical presence no I didn't feel it I jumped back because I thought someone was uh, gonna fall on top of me and uh, as soon as he was about to fall on top of me he disappeared <laughs> and uh, and that was in Peru no that was in uh, St. George all right and now you've got a story about Peru yeah um, I used to play football out there in Peru uh, I graduated in 82 I think I was a junior at the time. All right, listen. Hold on. I'm going to put you on hold. I'm going to do a newscast, and I'm going to come right back to you. Okay. All right, stay right there. And he's got a story about my hometown, Little Pahrump, Nevada. We're telling ghost stories, real ghost stories. If you have one, feel free to join us. If you don't, sit back and listen. Turn out the lights if you dare and the radio up. And uh, you may well, well may want to tell us as the morning wears on how you're doing. Line one, you're back on the air again. Okay. Um, and now, Pahrump, Nevada. Yeah. Uh, I, pl I was playing football for him, and uh, I think I was a junior, and uh, we had an away game. So I was on the varsity bus, and my sister was on the junior varsity bus. And uh, for some reason, the junior, har junior varsity bus got way behind us. And uh, so we showed up at the high school, and I had the car with me. And uh, so I decided to just stay there and wait for my sister with the car. And uh, after everybody had left, um, I got in the car, and I laid the seat back just to go to sleep. And uh, then next thing I noticed, the bus, the JV bus came, and I could see people walking out I could hear the voices I recognized the voices then I woke up and looked out and nothing was there <laughs> uh, I didn't think much of it because you know I just thought oh I'm just dreaming dreaming yeah. I went back to sleep and uh, I saw the exact same thing again I saw the bus saw the people getting out of the bus heard the voices and but this time I knew I was dreaming and and I tried to wake up and and I had a hard time uh, but finally, I, I woke myself up, looked out, and there was nothing there. Uh, so then I decided to go back to sleep. You know, that was a little scary, but but I went back to sleep, and I saw the exact same thing, only this time I saw my sister walk up to the side of the car. She had one of her friends with her, and she was asking to be let in. And this time, and I knew I was dreaming again, uh, but this time I had a real hard time waking up and uh, finally I had to scream just to wake up and but in that time I decided I'm getting out of here and so I just went home and decided to wait for the phone call at home and uh, and I've grown up and I've grown up in the country so you know being out out in the country alone at night never really bothered me but this really did and uh, I understand. I, I think it odd that you knew you were in a dream. I've never had that experience. My dreams have always been as reality until I woke up and knew. <laughs> you know, when you wake up, you know you had a dream, right? Uh -huh. But I never knew, I've never known in a dream that I was dreaming. That's odd. And I lived about a half a mile from one of those houses of ill repute that you talk about. So you know how far I had to drive home. From I, I, I do. I thank you for the call. All right, thanks. And, uh, yes, indeed. I know the area. Good morning on our phone. Uh, you would have been. Wild card line three and said you're on the air. Hello. Hello, Art. Um, I have a, a little story. Uh, this goes back to, uh, excuse me, about uh, uh, the early 70s. Where Where are you? I'm, I'm calling from uh, uh, Linwood, Washington. All right. ABI. The name's yes. Tom. Um, I was traveling across Nevada uh, from Idaho uh, down to California, mm -hmm. and it was early in the morning, and I was outside of Winnemucca uh, about uh, 5.30 or 6 o'clock, and I was by myself, and uh, uh, oh, I'm out of breath. Okay. Um, as, uh, as I was driving along, uh, it was out in the desert area, and there was absolutely virtually uninhabited. Right. And a car came up behind me with uh, two inhabitants who, uh, uh, they, they started following right on my bumper. And 
I became concerned because it, it became apparent that they had they were really interested in getting me stopped, and they would pull up alongside and, and uh, motion me over and, and things like that. Mm. And I, I I was afraid that uh, uh, you know I was afraid they were going to to uh, assault you, rob you, whatever. Uh huh. Yeah, sure. That'd be natural. So uh, as we went along, this this played out for for uh, several miles, and and. They kept motioning for me to, to pull over, and, and they they come up alongside, and, and I became quite fearful. Well, the uh, oddest thing happened. I had a flat tire, and I could feel the, the car start to sway. Sure. And, and I pulled up to a stop, and off to the right was a, uh, a house. And uh, these this car pulled up along and, and, and stopped behind me, and I didn't know what to do. I was afraid to get out. And somebody came out of this house to a pickup that, that was running. I mean, this was the only house in the area. There was nothing else around. Right. And he walked out and he looked. And one of the people in the car pointed to this guy. And then they, they went ahead and pulled on by me and, and took off. So I got out and, and I looked at the man and he, he was doing something around the pickup. And uh, so I went ahead and, and got my tire out and changed it and, and went on my way. Well, uh, this, this left, you know, it made me quite fearful. Yes. Well, uh, um, on the way back from, from uh, California back to Idaho, I looked for this, this place. Uh, to, I wanted to stop, and it, it left such a, a mark on me psychologically. Sure. Uh, I found the place. It was totally un uninhabited. No windows, no doors, <laughs> just a little shack. Yes. And what do you think happened to you? I, mean, I, I honestly don't know. Uh, I, I honestly feel that, that something, uh, wanted, something kept me from being harmed. Something wanted to warn you. Yes. It, it, well, that's, it, that's, these two guys away is what happened. That's quite a story. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Good morning. First time caller line, you're on the air. Good morning. Yeah, uh, good morning. Uh, <clears throat> where where are you, sir? I'm in Reno. Reno. I am. My name's John. I'm from, uh, well, actually, I'm in Sparks. I've been listening to your uh, show on uh, spooks and goblins here. And let me turn down this radio. No, uh, just Reno. actually turn it off all the way. Just extinguish it. There. It's out. Right. And uh, I got an interesting story. <laughs> Um, my wife used to, or my ex-wife used to dabble with uh, Ouija boards and mm -hmm. what have you, and I understand exactly how you feel. I can hear it in your voice, but uh, we were horsing around with it one night, and uh, the following weekend, I'd gone out fishing with a friend of mine and came back later that evening, and uh, we watched TV for a while, and then we went to bed, I guess about 11, 30, 12 o'clock at night. And uh, the back door of the house and the front door of the house were in line with each other. And uh, our bedroom was at the other end of the house. Right. And I was just dozing off, and I swore I heard the back door open. And somebody in heavy boots closed the door and walked through my kitchen. Mm -hmm. I went to my dresser drawer, and I grabbed my 9mm, and I took it out, and I'm standing in the hallway thinking, God, I hope I don't have to do this. I got locked and loaded, and I swung out into the hallway, and there was just enough residual light in the living room where I could see the silhouette of this individual, that six foot three, pretty stocky person. And I uh, uttered some explicatives deleted and told him to freeze right where he was or I was going to dump him. And you remember the old window shades where you take and you pull them down, you let them go, and they just go up and spin around? Very well, yes. Yeah, well, that's exactly what happened to this silhouette. Oh, 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 you're straight up. Really? Just like a window? To... Just just like the old window shades. It just went straight up and vanished. And uh, that was a very puckering experience, if you know what I mean. I know what you mean. And uh, I'll never forget it. That, uh, uh, we, we had other interesting happenings in that house, too. We had clocks that would mysteriously just slide off the shelf and drop onto the floor for no reason at all. 
Uh, well, this has been sphincter tightening enough for me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. This is oh, a geez. really great show. I want to get off the air and, li and listen some more. All right. Thank you. Have a good morning. Oh, boy. That's pretty descriptive, like a window. <laughs> like that. That's the kind of thing that will put you on your knees for a while. Line three, you're on the air. Uh, hi, Art. This is Chris in Carson City. Hi, Chris. Um, I'm calling. This is a story that my brother told All right. to me. All right. And I have no doubt that it's true. He, he doesn't engage in lying. But my brother was taking a nap. First of all, my father passed away in June of 91, and he had a very sudden heart attack. I mean, I had dinner with him an hour before, and he was perfectly fine. We were joking, and... People always say that he was fine. He was, and, and we were joking about a local casino. There were a like, and he didn't. He was saying, well, if I go in there to cash a check with you, I've got to take a shower because it's so greasy, you know. And he, he was just joking. Yeah. And it was very sudden. Nobody was expecting it. He died very quickly in, in his rocking chair in a candy bar. And... About six months later, my brother was taking a nap. He worked graveyard, and he had to sleep during the day. And he had somebody watching his children in the, in the other room. Well, in his dream, he heard a phone ring. Now, he has no phone in his bedroom. Mm. But in his dream, he heard the phone ring, and he picks up the phone, and it's my father on the other end of the line. Now, my father was a compulsive gambler, and I think one of the things that killed him was the stress of having gambled away everything that he and my mom had. Guilt. And my brother said that he heard casino noises in the background and the noises of slot machines and he could tell that, that my father was calling from a casino. Yes. He said, I have, I, I need to talk to you and I need to make it quick. I've gambled away all my prayers or I, I've, I've cast in all my prayers to make this call to you. And apparently the way my dad said, he said, the, the way my dad had it, People pray for you, and the prayers are part of the economy of this place where he was. And as many prayers as people prayed for you, that was the things that you could do. And he was using all his prayers to make this call. And he said, I have a message for you. He said, you are going, he says, you're going to die within a year. But that's not the message. I have a more important message that I really need to get to you. And before he could get the message to my brother, the phone went dead. And my brother woke up. He came out of the room and he didn't think much about it except that it was a dream and the stress of my father having passed away. Mm -hmm. And my little niece came in and said, Daddy, who called you and why is there a phone in your room? <laughs> and now it's been two years, my brother isn't dead. And so <clears throat> I kind of discounted the whole thing. Except that my mom said that there are, there are different ways of dying. Now when my dad died, my brother was always dependent on my dad for everything and never really could hold a job, never really could do anything. As soon as my dad died, my brother started going to college. He started getting work, getting a job. Doing all the things that had your dad lived, he would, want to, he would have wanted him to. Now, I think that my dad was saying that, hey, the old Dan is going to die in a year. There's going to be somebody, there's going to be a new Dan. That's the way I see it, that there's a response, of, there's a totally different man responsible, taking, taking responsibility in his life, doing the things in his life that he should be doing. I've got you. I've got you. I'd like to know, though, what the other message was. I can imagine. Thank you for the call. Thank you for the story. And a good one it was. Now, there's lots of ways to die. Line one, you're on the air. Good morning. Good morning. This is, <clears throat> this is Joyce Button. From Toppenish, Washington. Hi, Joyce. How are you doing this morning? Fine. Just fine. Good. Oh, well, first off, I wanted to tell you that I'm an Indian woman, and I really can identify with some of the things your callers have been saying. Um, but I wanted to talk about Uncle Joe. <laughs> Uncle Joe. All right. <laughs> if you can remember that fellow. Um, oh, I do very well, yes. Okay. I was married in 1977 to a man that... Um, well, they have a long, a long book. I guess it dates back years and years ago. And really wasn't paying a whole lot of attention to what was going on in his life. But being an Indian woman, there's a lot of spirituality in my own family line. But um, I thought it was really strange is 
how both of us kind of came together and a lot of really weird things were happening in our life. Of course, we're not married anymore, thank God. But <laughs> at the time, I didn't really understand what was going on with him. Um, but <clears throat> looking back on it, I, I'm kind of scared that if I ever see him again, it'll be right before I die. Um, because that fellow said, well, i got to go see Uncle Joe. Um, everywhere he went, and I know that his family, they were older, but he would go, like, to see, you know, he'd want to go see his aunt or his uncle or whatever, and right before he got there, they'd already be gone. And the same thing happened with the teacher that... It would be just a sudden impulse. He didn't have these frequently, uh, right? But when he did have them, somebody actually died? Right. And... Um, I really wasn't paying it a whole lot of attention, you know, what was going on until um, my foster father, who I was real close to, was he had a terminal illness, and we all knew he was going to pass away. He was dying of cancer on, over on Woodby Island. And, and I went over there, and I said, hey, I've got to go. I've got to get ready right now. And I threw my things together and took off. And, and I had this vision, one of the first visions I've had, and I've had quite a few since, but there was this um, airplane that looked like a tiny toy airplane and these um, three huge angels behind it. And then you could see inside this airplane and these passengers, but this one passenger I couldn't see their face. And it was a, like a real tiny airplane. And he was wearing a gray jacket. <clears throat> well, my husband had had to work overtime and said that he couldn't go uh, to see my father. And they were real close. Well, he came... So there was a knock at the door and I looked out and there he was and I was really didn't think anything of it and I opened up the door and there was this terrible feeling of death that just went right through me and my foster brother who was a nurse literally ran down the hall and he said don't let me get him ready for you first and I just got terrified and I took a look at his face and I said well, let's go across the street and mm. see the kids because they were staying at the neighbors and halfway through the clearing I felt my father die and I just felt so horrible when I felt his spirit, you know, just leave. And, of course, I knew my dad was dead, and I went and tried to get him involved with, looking, you know, seeing the children. When we got back, my mom was having a glass of pie cherry wine. Dad had made, always made wine himself, and she looked right at my husband's face, and she just, just with hate in her eyes, and she said, well, he's dead, you know, like he had been the one to kill him. And all of a sudden, I remember that vision of that gray coat and I looked at my husband and he was wearing that gray jacket and it was him he was coming you know in oh, that tiny boy. plane and that's how he had gotten there he had flown there uh, chartered a, a small plane to, to come into Woodville and taken a taxi and come to the house and all of a sudden all the pieces fit together and I looked back and I thought oh my god you know he told me that he was going down the hall right before his father died. Well, listen, we're out of time, but if ever a woman had reason not to see an ex, <laughs> uh, if you if you hear he's on the way to visit you, I'd grab the nearest passport and be headed out. I think I will. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. Bye-bye. And uh, on while we're on the subject of airplanes, I have a very good friend that works for one of the major airlines in this country, maybe the biggest airline, actually. And uh, there are some planes, and I'm intentionally not going to tell you which airline it is. Actually, they've made movies about it. But because of the violent nature of airplane crashes, Companies that have been in the business for a very long time and have had crashes know planes are haunted. There are some uh, bone-chilling stories to be told about haunted airplanes. And because I don't want to compromise something that's been told to me, I'm not going to pass it on to you. I'm just going to say believe it. There are some airplanes that are uh, uh, that have more flying than just the paying passengers. Let me put it that way. Good morning. On the first time caller line, you're on the air. Uh, this is Alan from Birmingham, Alabama. Alan from Birmingham. Hi, Alan. How you doing? Still doing the stuff on the ghost stories? Oh, we sure are, Alan. All right. Well, I got one for you. All right. All right. Me and my best friend. 
we've ever since we've met, we've been having like strange occurrences happening when it, wherever, whenever we're around each other. Right. And you know, we could like think know what each other's thinking, and if something happens to one of us, you know, the other knows about it and things like that. Sure. Well, he joined the army about two and a half years ago. Good morning. I kind of like to share a story of, well, three stories if I have the time. All right. Where are you? Where are you, please? I'm in Little Lake, California. Little Lake, California. All right. Go ahead. The uh, first uh, time that I ever had some sort of strange experience, I was lying in my bed with my eyes closed and I could see these faces floating through my room. And they were a lot like the faces out of the death pits of the concentration camps. They were hollow-eyed and gaping mouths. And at first I was kind of, uh, oh, uh, mystified by it. And it seemed like minutes, but I'm sure it was only seconds. And I thought to myself, well, if you're here for good, you can stay. If not, if you're here for no goodness, Go, go now, and immediately the faces disappeared. The other story, um, my husband was in the Pacific, and uh, he was fighting the Japanese. And there was a young Marine that came back across the no man's land, and the Japanese were shooting everything they had. And and when he got to the other uh, to to their lines. Um, he was riddled with bullet holes from his waist down. His legs were, all his bones in his legs were shattered. And whenever the um, chaplain asked how he got there, he only replied, my father brought me back, my father brought me back. And whenever it come uh, to find out, the I, I think the um, Yank Magazine wrote it up, uh, in um, the fact that the chaplain found out that uh, the father had died in the Battle of Aragon or some other battle. The third one was, uh, oh, a couple years ago here at my home, um, we had these footsteps constantly, uh, oh, maybe two or three times a month out across the patio and uh, wooden deck. And my husband was out in the workshop working one day and and um, well, each time we'd hear these footsteps, we'd check them out. There would be nothing there. And this particular night, he was working out in the workshop, and he thought I'd called him, and, and I said, no. And he went on back to what he was doing, and suddenly a hammer flew across the workshop and just missed him by fractions, and there wasn't a soul nowhere. Wow. And, uh, we have no idea how the hammer or who threw the hammer, but it went across the shop nevertheless. Unmistakable message, nevertheless. Nevertheless. Uh, thank you very much for your call. Mm -hmm. And adding to our list of uh, incredible stories this morning. Some of these have been truly incredible. And uh, I'm, I'm going to have to sit down and listen to a tape of this program myself. We'll be right back. <laughs> First time caller line, you're on the air. Good morning. Hi, where are you, ma'am? Spokane, Washington. Spokane. This is back in the 50s. Oh, gosh, wait, I turn this darn heater down. I'll be right back. Oh, that's quite all right. Go ahead. Um, we have no open lines right now. When we do, you know the numbers. Pick one and, uh, and call it. Hold up here. Yes. Um, back in the 50s, my husband and I had, uh, he was a hard rock miner uh, up here in Washington State, and... Uh, I had gone down to California, and I tried to talk him into coming down there and get a job in the shipyard, which he used to work in, and got that all arranged. And I had a, a, a little, uh, just a one little apartment, and I went and got a, uh, had a lease on a lease option to buy on a place, and I transferred my mail over to a little mailing thing. Well, he called me up and said he would be down in a couple of days. So... I was busy from one place to the other and so forth. I'm driving down Vermont Avenue, and uh, I look in the rearview mirror, and there he is in a black sedan with another guy driving. And he smiled and waved at me. 
And I thought, oh, that son of a gun, he got here two days early. <laughs> I drove around home and got everything ready, made a pot of coffee and everything. He didn't show up, didn't show up, and I had to go over to the other house. I left a note on the door, went over to the care of the apartment that I was going to uh, rent with option to buy and so forth. It was a duplex. Right. It paid for itself and everything because the beauty operator was in the other half. And I was real proud of that. Went back home, didn't hear anything. About four days later, I got a letter in this little mail office. The girl called me and said, you've got a letter from uh, a poem. And I went over, picked it up, and he had written to me. And a couple of days later, I got a telegram that he had been killed the day after I saw him in the car. Oh, gee. I have never remarried. It was such a blow. I just, I, I just couldn't believe it. I mean, he was killed. And he had sold the house. He had sold our furniture. He had packed up things to ship and everything. And he was killed the day before he was supposed to work one shift and leave and the next morning, and he was killed. And so as a result, you have never remarried? No. It was just too much. I understand. And I really appreciate your taking the trouble to call us. Thank you. Take care. Hmm. Line three, you're on the air. Good morning. Hello. Are, are you there? I'm here. <laughs> I just wanted to say, um, I had a, an incident happen about four years ago. I went to my mother's house, and my mother has her grandmother. At the time, was her mother was living with her, and she was approximately about 90 years old, and um, v pretty well bedridden. I mean, she couldn't get out past the kitchen. Sure. And uh, we went to dinner. I just happened to stop by and see her. And she said, let's go to dinner. And I said, fine. So before we left, she always keeps the windows locked. We always locked the doors. I mean, that was just one of her pet peeves. And we went to dinner. It was about 20 minutes away from where we were at. And we were there and we were talking. And we were, I never really got to know much about my grandmother. And I had said something about, well, what was my grandfather like? And we talked. And she said he was real mean and vindictive to your grandmother. And that was one of the main reasons why they divorced. And he died. He was an alcoholic, and he passed away so many years before this. So, I mean, we went into other conversations, and at the end of the evening, we went back to the house. We came out, went to the back door, and in my mom's bathroom, which is at the other end of the house, there would have been no way my grandmother could have got, because she had a wheelchair to the kitchen. That was as far as she could go, because she right. was in a trailer house. Right. And we got to the back bathroom, and I, had, I happened to go in first. And I walked in, and I was just about to shut the door, and just something told me, don't shut the door all the way. I looked up, and on the inside of the door, she had one of those lengthway mirrors of the door length. Oh, yes. It had been, been lifted up past the doorway, and then it was like about two feet above the doorway, and it had been tightened all the way. And it had like, a, it probably had about 12 or 13 of those latches you screw in and tighten. Right. Every one of the latches was completely tight, because I just completely went over this thing. There was no forced entry. There was there was nobody had a key. The only people that have a key to that house is my mom and my dad. And he lived up in Ely, and I just this chill just ran down my back because if anybody was to break into the house, I mean there was just no godly reason why they would just raise this mirror up and tighten it down like they did. And I told her to come in. I says, "Were you messing with the mirror earlier this afternoon?" She said, "No, I I never mess with the mirror." And she looked in, and her face just turned white. And, I mean, it was just really weird. And we went in to check on my grandma to make sure she was all right. And she was in the other room. Just, she was just muttering my grandfather's name, just kept muttering. I mean, she never really ever talks about him. And she just kept muttering. I mean, she didn't say, just kept saying his name over and over and over again. And, I mean, after that, I mean, I've, I've heard stories and stuff. And I used to be skeptic about it, but never, never again. I mean, to this day, well, we took the mirror off the next day. I mean, she didn't even want the mirror in the house. I took it to the dump and got rid of it. But, I mean, that is that is probably one of the weirdest things I've ever, ever had happen to me or to her, for that matter. Well, you've told that story on the right morning, sir. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Take care. And I just, I know that a lot of you sitting out there listening to all of this this morning have got to be going through some changes, because I sure am. These aren't nuts. These people are literate, obviously well-educated, articulate, young, old, middle-aged. That last caller was just another example. 
How can you ignore it? Good morning. On our first time caller line, you're uh, on the air. Hello, Art. Hi. Hi, this is John calling from Fairbanks, Alaska. Hi, John, all the way from Fairbanks. Yes, um, I want to know if perhaps you're having some poltergeist in your radio feeds tonight. I hope not. Why do you ask? I don't know if any other callers have picked this up, if it's in one of your network feed, feeds or what, but uh, periodically, starting with your first hour through your second, third hour, every so often I'd hear a background noise that sounded like a duck quacking. Uh, I mean, this, <laughs> come on. I'm recording your program, and there are quacking ducks or poltergeist or something on your program. I'm, I'm sure other listeners. Uh, do you have Do you have the tape there? I, I have the tape going right now. Look, oh, well, you have it going now to record your own call. Exactly. I turned everything way down, but hopefully I can still record it. But um, periodic. All right. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Okay. I'm going to terminate this conversation with you now. Mm -hmm. And what I want you to do is cue your recorder to where you've got that on tape. Okay. And call me back and play it. Okay. Can you? Will you do that? Um, tonight. Tonight. Okay, I'll try because it's been probably an hour since I've heard it, but I'll try to get it for if you. you. If you can do it, call me back on the same line. Okay. All right. I'll try to do that because I wanted to share a couple stories with you. Well, if you, if you want to do all right, fine. Uh, go ahead and share. You've got time to share one now. Go ahead. I'll try to do that. But um, when I went to uh, school, I went to school with this boy, and he had a pretty rough life. He lost one brother in the eighth grade due to some childhood illness, and then uh, a brother that was a couple years older than him went to Vietnam. And he was killed when he was um, a gunner on board a helicopter, and he was killed in action in Vietnam. And... He uh, led a fairly unhappy life, and we uh, parted ways, and I joined the Air Force, and, and I um, ended up in Alaska, and I was uh, stationed at Isleson Air Force Base, and um, one night he came to me in a dream, and, and he was very sad in the dream, and, and he was um, crying, and he, and he expressed to me in the dream that he was, he'd been hurt badly, and he just had a car wreck, and I just thought it was a dream, and... Um, and a few days later, I received a letter from my mom and a newspaper clipping that he'd been killed in a car wreck. Oh, boy. And, All right. And well, it was for more than a coincidence. I understand. All right. Look, let's hold it here. Call me back with that tape. <laughs> Line three, you're on the air. Yeah. Um, actually, I have a ghost story that I'm still trying to resolve now. I'm trying to find out who the ghost is. However, it's kind of a mundane ghost story. You mean this is going on now? Yeah, at where I work. All right. Like, it's, it's real mundane. He just walks through the place and doesn't bother anyone. But when um, when I lived in Santa Barbara, my father was a pastor of a church. And he was a part-time pastor. A, church couldn't afford, a small church couldn't afford to pay him. Part, part of his compensation was is we lived in some apartments in the second story of the church. Mm -hmm. This building was built at the oh, late 19th century. So when we were living there, maybe had 90 years on it. Sure. Um, very old, very oppressive building. Um, everyone I know who lived there was terrified, I mean literally terrified, to go downstairs when it was dark. And, you know, it just, it was my job, for instance, to go turn on the lights in the morning. Mm -hmm. Sunday morning I had to go turn my dad, Gee. many years later, said, well, I didn't want your sisters doing that. You know, why do I have to? Well, right. Lucky you. Yeah. Well, I, I swear, the, we go down in the dark, and there was something there. I just, there was something there. I knew it. I found out I'm not the only one who felt that way. There were some people we knew who lived there after we did. Everyone in that family refused to go downstairs when it was dark. Any time somebody went down there, they knew something was there <laughs> well we later found out someone had committed suicide in that church yeah, there you go very many years earlier someone committed suicide in that church one of the people who lived there when he was a member of the church he lived there at the same time we did mm -hmm. he very nice guy it turned out you know, this happened just a few years ago this man murdered his I mean he just flipped out and he murdered his mother and his father hmm. and he'd lived in that church for, for years I don't know if it's connected but he had flipped out he murdered his mother and his father it absolutely wouldn't surprise me that made and it made it made in fact it made the news here in town 
And um, this happened a couple years ago in Santa Barbara. Mm -hmm. He knifed his mother and father. The church was sold. Uh, a military prep school bought it and had a bunch of cadets living there and going to school there. Right. Some of those cadets got it in their mind to go down and kill a homeless person. The military academy got closed down because their cadets had committed murder. I went back a couple years ago and, and with a friend who also used to live there, we went to the place because she still lives in Santa Barbara. She goes, well, it's a coffee house now. No, that's not just something you get on your mind. Yeah, exactly. And um, we went to the coffee house, and now the coffee house was an occult theme. And you go in, and what I felt when I went in there by myself, and just in all the paintings on the wall, all the decorations was there. We talked to a man whose studio was upstairs in what used to be our apartments. Yes. He said he would not stay there at night. At night, when it got dark, he went home. Whatever it was. But was that building was not a pleasant place. I've got you, sir. Thank you very much for the call. Uh, I've sure got you. I'll tell you. Uh, that really does seem to go on. It does seem to stay within buildings, structures, where things have occurred. Though on other occasions, spirits, ghosts, if you want, have followed people. Not let them go. When they're part of it, they seem to get followed. Line one, you're on the air. Hello? Hello. Hi, Art. I got a strange story. I used to live in um, Taiwan. Oh, yes. And um, a friend and I had uh, just uh, were moving into an apartment. And the apartment had one bedroom, and there was two of us. So we had them put in a wood partition in the middle. Mm -hmm. And um, one night we had come home kind of late, and uh, we had getting ready to go to sleep. And um, he was in his bed, I was in my bed, and we heard these uh, noises, these strange noises, like somebody was throwing uh, BBs on a on a like a refrigerator, you know, a metallic sound. Sure. And um, I can imagine BBs on a fridge. <laughs> Anyway, I was I said, you know, cut it out and he kept telling me to cut it out. You know, we were blaming each other. Right. So uh, I didn't <laughs> think anything of it. And all of a sudden I kinda of see my friend and he's sneaking around this wood partition, you know, the lights are out. Yes. And I'm trying not to laugh because uh, you know, I'm kinda of hiding under the covers and I see him coming around here and I'm saying, Well, as soon as he gets to the bed I'm gonna really scare this guy because he doesn't even know I'm looking at him. <laughs> and so he gets to the bed and I throw up the covers and I, you know, scream at him. And uh, I hear my friend in his bed say, you know, Tony, cut it out. And uh, I tell you, I, I, I just broke out into like a cold sweat. And I laid back, I laid back on the bed, and the bed started to, like it was on the ocean. It just started to move. This so, one, you know. And, uh, you know, I told him, I says, hey, turn on the lights, you know. And he heard the, you know, the way I was saying it. And he turned on the lights, and I had him check the front door and the windows. And there was nobody there. And um, needless to say, you know, I, I, I had, like, friends stay over, like, the next week or so. I and, 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 keep in there. Yeah. And that was it. And you say the bed moved like a, uh, like ocean waves. Like, like I was on the ocean. Just the whole bed was just, like, floating. Yeah, that bothers me. Hi, how are you doing? Fine. Well, my story is, uh, my son used to come in. He was uh, 19 years old, and he used to pick roses all the time for me. Right. So... One day, he said that he was going to go out of state, and I, I didn't agree. He says, let me go. He says, I have a premonition that I don't have a lot of lifespan. I says, don't be silly. I said, it's anybody that's going to go first, it'll be me. He says, well, he says, promise me if anything happens to me, he says, you'll send me roses. I says, oh, yeah, and send me lilacs. <laughs> right. So a year later, he got in a car accident, and he passed away. Christmas. We lived in an old, old farmhouse over 100 years old. The doorbell was not connected, and the door, the doors were jammed. The one door is never open. All, uh, two days after he died, the doorbell rang, and the doors flew open, and you could smell roses. Oh. He had come back to say goodbye. Oh. And you smelled roses. Yeah, the smell of roses. And we were just... How did you react emotionally when that happened? I had a very good feeling because he came back to say goodbye to me. And I knew that there was something. 
that there was something because he was only uh, 20 years old when he passed away. There is something, ma'am. Yes, definitely. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for the story. A lot of stories like that, variations of it. People who have left didn't get finished with their business before they had to go. Good morning. On the first time caller line, you're on the air. Art, this is John calling you back from Fairbanks. Hi, John. Oh, yes, John. I've edited the tapes. Now, I'm going to try to let you hear this duck quacking, and this was just a few minutes ago when you were talking to uh, the young gentleman just before you took your station break. Yes. Now, if this doesn't come across from this portable tape player, I will make copies and send them to you and let you pick it up yourself. All right, let's hear it. Here it goes. This is just from about ten minutes ago. We'll see how this comes across the network. Here it goes. Hold on, I said, hey, turn on the lights, you know, and he heard the, you know, the way I was saying it, and he turned on the lights, and I had him check the front door and the windows, and there was nobody there. And uh, needless to say, you know, I, I, I had, like, friends stay over. I absolutely heard it. Hear that? I heard it. That's been on your program all evening long sporadically, that duck quacking noise. Well, I wonder if people at other affiliates have heard that. I, I figured some other caller would, would identify it to you because I've heard it from the beginning of your show. All right, it was clearly there. Either we have a, um, a board operator in uh, in Fairbanks who, um, uh, who who has a sense of humor or from a source that... Uh, no doubt you suspect. <laughs> It'd be interesting to know, but uh, I've been hearing it from your hour one on through. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you Art. for the callback. And uh, I heard it quite clearly. That was in Fairbanks. Hmm. Well, what about some of you at other affiliates? Did you hear any such thing? I assure you I did nothing like that here. Nothing. <laughs> You're on the air. Good morning, Art. Oh, good morning. Yes. Um, I wanted to say when I was a teenager, I was sleeping away, and uh, in this dream, I was holding up my ca uh, casket. So I was screaming, and my mother came running in, and she said, what's the matter? I said, I'm holding up a casket. And she said, who's in it? And I said, your brother. So in two days, she got the call. He had died. Oh, uh, I, you, how did she... You know, when you told her that in the first place... I've seen his face in the casket. How did she react to that when you told well, her? Yeah. She was more or less a psychic herself, and she believed it. He had a sunstroke. And then another time, my dad had to... We lived on the farm, and he had to go to another city in the same state, not far away. And uh, his sister wasn't expected to live. So we didn't have a phone, so a friend had came over and told him that his sister was sick. So he went, and sure enough, about four days later, in the middle of the night, the clock, you know, we had a clock that struck the hour. Sure. And sure enough, the clock used to went bong, bong. This time went bong, bong. So my mother said, Hey, she just died, and she did. Well, your mother had the power then. Yes, the clock really told us that she had died. Thank you. <laughs> Have a good morning. Coincidence? Maybe. All of these stories, coincidence? Not likely. What do you conclude? Wild card line three, you're on the air. Oh, this is a true story. This is Pat Fitzpatrick from Silver Springs, Nevada. This is a true story about about an an Irish and a, a, a British ghost, uh, it, and uh, about whom a a poem a poem was written by William Butler Yeats called "The Ghost of Roger Casement." In it, uh, Casement was uh, executed by the British and the Irish government since, since they became independent. Wanted his body. Every year they'd ask for his body, and finally they got the body back 30 years later when a, 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 a labor government came to power. But one of Casement's last wishes was, do not let my body rest in this place, which is England. Yes. Butler wrote, wrote the poem. He said, I can't sleep at night. 
I hear a knocking on my door. I just cannot sleep. And finally, uh, at the end of it, he says, it's the ghost of Roger Caseman knocking on my door. And then the British guy, and of course, that poem, it was, it, it was, it was published by it just when Ireland was about to go in on the, on the British side in, in the Second World War. And because the British government had refused to, to, to give the body back, the Irish government stayed, stayed neutral. That's quite a story. Yeah, William Butler Yeats, the Thank ghost of Roger Caseman. Thank you, my friend. Bye. Have a good morning. Mr. Fitzpatrick. Line three, you're on the air. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Um, I've got, I'm going to relate a story that uh, goes back to 1968. Um, I was drafted, sent to Nam because of the tremendous turnover of people and, and whatnot. Well, I, I was in the infantry. We were um, stationed in a small fire base close to the Cambodian border. Mm -hmm. And it was an evening where it was our turn to go out and um, set up a um, an ambush. We um, set it all up. We had everything laid out so that if Charlie came walking along, we could uh, do our thing. Sure. And one one guy was awake. The rest of us were asleep. That gentleman woke us all up. There was six of us, and we all saw a small party of, of um, Vietnamese coming at us. They were, they were armed and whatnot, and um, at, at the appropriate time, we sprung the ambush and whatnot, and nothing happened. I mean, they just kept right on walking through it, not even looking at us. Like Incredible. It was, it was the most crazy thing that happened over there. While I was there, imagine everybody check their ammunition. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know when you when you let go with a claymore, you you know something goes. Yeah, absolutely. And it was the most. I mean, the country itself is a spiritual country, but then to have that happen, and I've never seen. You know, I don't know any of the other gentlemen. I don't know if it's that's, with us. Yeah, I don't know if it's that surprising, sir. People who die violent deaths tend to linger and there are a lot of violent deaths in war I've never experienced anything like it and I doubt if I ever will but it was and I've never told anybody about it big effect on your life um, it well without a doubt <laughs> without a doubt the whole thing was was a big effect on my life well I'm honored that you chose uh, this moment to tell this oh, it story. was uh, it was uh, it was a good time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Letting me say it. Thank you. Have a good morning. Do you believe him? Did he sound crazy to you, affected? Oh, I suppose you might say that with the strain of war, combat, things like that might happen. Might be a mass hallucination. Or more likely, not. Good morning. On the first time caller line, you're uh, on the air. Hello, I'm calling from Mesa, Arizona. Mesa, welcome to the program. Yeah. Well, this takes place on the Navajo Reservation, mm -hmm. um, near the trailhead of Rainbow Bridge, and in the vicinity of Navajo Mountain. My father and I were camping in about 1976, and we were camping in the ruins of the old Rainbow Lodge. It had burned down some, I don't know how many years ago. Yes. And uh, as we were going to sleep after we'd put the campfire out, uh, we both felt um, a presence of some sort. Uh, didn't see anything. It was something we both felt. Uh, the most notable thing is that my father is a preacher, um, a free Methodist preacher, and he also has a, uh, uh, a master's degree in archaeology, or anthropology, I should say. And he, uh, he felt it too. I know he did because he said he wanted to offer a prayer. And uh, he prayed uh, something about a, you know, a, having a shepherd and he'll watch the sheep. Sure. And... Uh, well, it uh, I guess eventually disappeared because we both went to sleep and didn't really talk much about it after that. And that was uh, that's about the only thing I've ever happened uh, close to that, close to anything ghostly. But it was enough that you knew that it was something. It was there. There was a definite apprehension, you know, a feeling of apprehension in the air. 
And I'm sure that uh, people who have lived out on the reservation or have visited or uh, you know, been in the, uh, the sacred parts, which is, uh, I guess, Navajo Mountain is part of the sacred area, have stories like this. And uh, I'd be interested to hear from them, too. Maybe you will. Thank you for the call. Gotcha. Right. The presence felt, distinctly felt. Have you ever felt that? No question about it. Something's there. Or no question about it, something cold and not uh, particularly welcome is in your area. It's not a trivial emotion. It's overwhelming. It comes in waves. Have you ever felt it? Line one, you're on the air. Good morning, Art. The fellow from Fairbanks is exactly right. I've been jiggling my radio, wondering what's wrong with it tonight. Usually. Where are you? Anchorage, Kerry and I, you come in usually as clear as a bell tonight. It's been glitches and pops and uh, strange. Really? Strange. I have a story about witchcraft in the Arctic and immortality. All right. 1961, I was visiting an old Eskimo friend in Teller, which is up on the Seward Peninsula, hop, skip, and a jump across from Siberia. Yes, sir. Here, the Arctic Circle, a beautiful day, and uh, this old man, William McQuillock, tribe historian for that Mary Zigloo tribe, uh, quite a famous Eskimo and a young man. We took a skiff, went about 30 miles out of Teller to uh, snipe for gold up a uh, little creek at an abandoned gold mine. Mm -hmm. I was walking along the creek, and I saw something I couldn't believe. A track of a human footprint, left foot, barefoot, in the sand. The creek had just dropped, and this was very, very fresh, and I, I couldn't believe it. My foot was exactly 12 inches long. This was 4 inches longer than mine. One human footprint in a place where you had to walk carefully or you'd cut your rubber boots on the sharp rocks, a lot of quartz there. I called William and his cousin over, what is this? He took one look, turned and started walking away, both of them. About a mile back down to the skiff, and I couldn't figure out what's wrong with him. He acted afraid. I went down and after a lot of persuasion, he told me a story of the most famous shaman turn of the century, there was a huge Eskimo, nearly seven feet tall, he said, a huge man, who traveled amongst the villages. Strangely, he'd show up 150 miles away in one day. He preached to the people. He healed the sick. He even raised the dead, William told me. A young boy had died, and he put a tent over the grave, crawled in, a big uh, noise, a roaring sound, and he walked out with the boy. This is a famous shaman. Turn of the century, the great Nome Gold Rush. The army came to try to keep order. They had a law that no witchcraft could be practiced. Well, this huge shaman showed up outside of Nome, and a troop of uh, soldiers went out with a captain to arrest him because he was preaching revolt and warning the people, the Eskimo, against the coming white man. He said, you cannot do anything to me. I have powers greater than you. And he had a man take a spear and stab him to prove it spit on his hands, rubbed his side, and there was no scar. And the captain almost went nuts, but he arrested him. They put him on a boat to take the shaman to Seattle for trial, and a storm immediately came up and was about to sink the boat. And they looked, and the shaman, instead of being in the brig, was sitting on the stern looking back at the land. <laughs> so they put him back in the brig. A few minutes later, he was back on the deck. The captain went berserk, and the sailors turned the boat around and put the... Uh, I'm on back ashore near Nome, and I'm he sure. told me, now you know about the track. He is still here in <laughs> Oh, that's a great story. Those are great stories. Thank you for the call. Good evening. You take care. Now, sailors, uh, <laughs> sailors particularly um, wouldn't, wouldn't sail under those conditions. And you know that goes for sailors today, too. It hasn't changed. You don't uh, don't venture out to sea uh, with that sort of thing around you. You don't do it. You just don't do it today or then. Good morning. On the first time caller line, you're on the air. Hi, this is Mark again from Canes Arm Bakersfield. Hi, Mark. I just wanted to say real quick, you haven't heard any quacking ducks, but we've had a similar experience before about a month ago during your show. What, what, what did you hear? And uh, some ladies had called up during business hours and said they kept hearing someone saying they were going to kill them way in the background. Really? Yeah. So I don't know, maybe somebody along the line is... 
Well, you never know, of course, uh, Mark, as you well know, you would have the power there to make something... Uh... Yeah, they thought one of us was doing it or something. I see. <laughs> well, I appreciate the information. I find it a little unsettling. Though. Yeah, okay, just want to let you know. Thank you, Mark. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. That's a board operator there in uh, Bakersfield. Well, that unsettles me a little. Line two, you're on the air. How you doing, Art? Okay. Uh, I got a story about uh, my uncle who died about three years ago. He died about 2 o'clock in the morning. Mm. So we all go to the hospital and, you know, con condole my aunt. And uh, then it was, you know, getting pretty early in the morning, so we all went home for a few hours. And then we came back. And as we all come back in the morning to her house, there's this dog that has just parked itself outside the front of the house. And every time somebody got out of the car, who was part of the immediate family, the dog came up to them, sat there until you petted it, and then walked away. And as soon as the whole immediate family, who was there, you know, came to the house, the dog went away, and we never saw the dog again. What? What? Do you, do you have any idea what dog this was, or it looked like a little terrier or something? Well, not 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 what kind, but uh, whose or why it did what it did? Any idea? I don't know, but it was just a little tiny dog that was so full of life, and it's, I mean, my uncle was the same way. Here was a guy who was just so full of life, and it was just strange. It just it waited to greet everyone that came to the house, and after everyone got there, the dog was gone. We never saw it again. Well, that's really something. Really weird story. I don't know. I don't know what it was, but it's weird. I thank you for the call. You're welcome. You take care.